What is up, Copy Squad? Happy Sunday. I'm coming to you live on Facebook from Delray Beach, Florida. And today I want to talk about how to get a job at Agora Financial. A couple people have asked me this several times, and it's usually in the email. And uh, if you're like an email subscriber, you can always reply to any of my emails, and I'm happy to chat with you. So, uh, yeah, you can go to kylethewriter.com forward slash swipe and check out emails. But anyway, <coughs> the story, I've told the story before, and it's actually a sort of long story. There's a short version and a long version, and I got a really good response from telling a long version. So I figure for today's live, I will tell you the whole story for how I got my job at Agora Financial, and hopefully you can glean some value from it because your boy was absolutely unqualified to work at Agora Financial when he got his job, but he got the job, right? So um, we're gonna go through it, and it all starts with high school Kyle. That's right, we're going all the way back to high school. I'm 30 years old right now, so this is gonna be a long story. But uh, basically, this all starts with a dude. It starts like every great story, right? It's about a dude chasing girls. <laughs> so. Um, anyway, in high school, Kyle was not the most popular dude. Um, I had like every chip on the shoulder that a person could have, and it, it was, uh, uh, my family didn't have a lot of money. I had a single parent home. It was me and my sister and my dad, and uh, he was a carpenter during the 2008 housing crash, and I was still in high, I had just gone from high school to college. Um, so anyway, during that turbulent period, we didn't have any money before that. We didn't have any money. I never had any money growing up. So there's a chip on the shoulder for that. Um, I actually was always, uh, I was always kind of small. So like I could never make like a big impact in sports. So uh, I'm about five, seven. And it's not like a, a great athletic size. And um, so I always had a chip on my shoulder about that. Uh, all the tall guys got the girls. Uh, we were broke. I couldn't afford name brand clothes. So I had a chip on my shoulder about that. I was walking around in like Walmart gear. Everybody else was driving like brand new Mustangs as soon as they turned 16. That was the hot car. Uh, so I, was, I had a chip on my shoulder about that. I had thin hair. Uh, so my hair started thinning for some reason at like 16. And, and then it just, it just, that was it, man. It was over for me. And I kind of just like rocked it a little bit long. And that was a mistake too. So uh, I got a notification. So yeah, I had a chip on my shoulder about that. It wasn't until like my senior year of high school that I actually finally got a girlfriend. And uh, th there was like, that kind of like kept with me. And a lot of the problem was I had all these chips on my shoulders and all these insecurities inside of me. So go to college and I decide to study psychology. And the reason I like to get into psychology was because how do I become more likable, right? I was never popular as I wanted to be in high school. I couldn't uh, get the girls, I couldn't like make friends easily. Um, I am like a natural introvert. I love to read and just type on my computer now and that I'm an adult and I'm totally cool with that now. But in high school and college, I felt like a total outcast. Like I, I was always um, not as popular as I would like to have been. So I study psychology, I'm gonna learn the secrets, right? I'm gonna hack, so I'm gonna hack talking to people. I'm gonna hack being cool guy. So I study social psych and I get really into like conformity and compliance kind of stuff and just general social psych. And um, I actually had a, I had a friend sales funnel. I had a, I had a sales funnel for making friends in college. And I didn't even realize it. Um, in class, I would like hand out notes, like, uh, mostly to the girls and basically invite them to our apartment. My, I had two roommates and we would just buy like $400 worth of booze. And I would just have like all these people over. And this is actually when I wrote my first piece of copy, like my apartment would get slammed and we would go to like 5 a.m. And that's how I made friend, uh, friends in college. So I wrote my first piece of copy after social psych. I learned about, um, I think it was like foot in the door. And I had like this tip jar to help us pay for all this booze. Because we did spend like hundreds of dollars on like bush light. So I had a tip jar and I wrote a sticky note and I taped it to the side of the tip jar. And I said, um, please leave a tip for the hosts. Even a penny will, will help and a smiley face underneath it. And I had gotten that from a study that said, basically, if you ask for a penny, then that seems like a very simple request, and they will naturally give more. So that was like my first effort in copywriting, and I didn't even know what I was doing. So that was kind of a neat thing that when I, when I learned about it later in copywriting that, uh, 
that I was actually practicing it before. So I had to take notes because the story is so long. All right, so graduate college. Um, I don't actually like learn uh, any lessons about being like a mature <laughs> individual or like being a, a better person yet. So I become a, a college graduate and I got a psych degree and it's, it's time to get like a job and I don't want any like $30,000 job, I wanna be rich. So I Yahoo search what's the best career and a CPA pops up, accountant, public accountant. So I'm like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go do that. So I go back to UNC Chapel Hill for their master's of accounting degree and I do that. Uh, let's see, I got any notes about that. I wanted to be rich. Oh yeah, I wanted to be rich too because I still was trying to get uh, more girls. I was still compensating a little bit. So I get the master's, I do all the CPA exams, I put myself through hell basically, uh, just trying to chase that dollar bill. And then I get a job at a public accounting firm and I absolutely hated it. I hate, I was miserable, man. I, I was terrible at it. This is spreadsheets. And then I read uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad made it like 10 times worse because I realized I was trading my time for dollars and I started to calculate what my, my time was worth. I was getting a salary. The salary starting was $52,000, which was like so mind blowing, but my student loans were $800 a month. So I was like, oh, awesome, 52 grand. But then for some reason, wasn't going very well. And I calculated it like during busy season, I was making like $18 an hour. And I was like, what the hell did I go to college for if I'm making $18 an hour? Because I was working a, a salary job. So, so no matter how hard I worked, uh, I would actually make less money the, the harder I worked. And if I finished things early, what that would earn me is the right to work on another project that was behind schedule because they needed more help. And I was like, okay, the salary thing sucks. I'm not doing this. This is terrible. So I quit. All right. <laughs> I got, I got like, uh, like 70 grand in graduate school debt. My, my student, oh, wait, I don't quit. I get fired. I get myself fired. I'm, I'm, uh, I actually get fired twice. I get fired from that job. I pick up another job in accounting, and uh, I hate that one too. And this is about the time where I kind of discovered blogging, and this is all still tied to chasing girls a little bit. I'm actually blogging about my dating life, which was kind of a shit show, all right, back then. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing for fun, and I'm actually doing it at work because I hate my job so much, and I get fired from that job. So I got fired from two jobs uh, in accounting, and then, then I say, okay, maybe accounting's not for me. So then I actually have all this debt. I paid off a little bit from my jobs. And then uh, I'm unemployed. I, give, I do try to apply to a couple more accounting jobs. And it doesn't work out. Like I, I'm not an accounting guy. So I take all this debt, my master's degree. I've passed the CPA exams. I put myself through hell to pass those four exams. It was like the hardest thing ever. And I go work an entry-level sales job on the phone selling Verizon Fios, which is like Verizon's TV internet service in like Florida and New York and New Jersey. So I learned sales process and I kind of like that job. It kind of sucks, but I kind of like that job because now I'm getting rewarded for my efforts. So what I'm doing now is I'm a top performer, man. I'm crushing it. I'm working six days a week. I stay late. I come in early. Nah, I never came in early. I won't lie. But I do stay late. I try to make as much money as possible. I try to crush everybody because I'm still chasing that dollar, right? And I'm still blogging on the side. And at this time, I even start writing a book about those dating experiences, right? So I've got all these blog articles I've been writing <laughs> about my terrible dating life. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna write a book about this. And I thought I could make, I could start having like a secondary, like passive income source. That was like my big goal, passive income, passive income, passive income. So I'm gonna write a book. Um, I work six days a week. I absolutely slaughter the sales competition. And on the last day of the month, I'm so far ahead of everybody that I'm sitting there at my station and I look at my PM, performance manager, and I was like, where am I at? He's like, you're like 40,000 sales points ahead of the next guy or whatever. I was like, okay, I'm just going to go home. Like nobody can catch me. I'm so far ahead. The biggest check I ever made, I was, I put in overtime. I got the bonuses for being number one. I got the commission, which is going to be higher than everybody else's commission. And I just got like the regular salary too, or, or hourly stuff. Eight grand. <laughs> Eight grand. And it cost me like every day of the week. And then I kind of looked at that and I was like, okay, so this seems like a ceiling. I'm not going to work seven days a week. 
and I get eight grand. It's not good enough. So uh, I bounce. I'm gone. Go to a B2B sales job. That's where I think, okay, the sky's the limit of B2B. I'll sell, I'll sell, I'll sell stuff to a business, which is going to generate way bigger commissions, and maybe like residuals, stuff like that. And this job treats me really well. Uh, I feel like I, I did a really bad exit with them that I should probably have not done. Basically, here's two things happen. Um, they flew me out to Denver to get training, which was amazing. All right. And then they flew me to California for like the entire company thing. And I met and the CEO was there. Right. So here's here's what happened. Uh, the CEO was at the front and one guy asked that age old question to the CEO. He says, OK, if uh, you had one piece of advice to give all of us new guys starting out now, what would it be? There's a room full of people, right? And this guy built this company. I guess I could tell you. It's Ring Central. All right? It's like a, a – basically, you know what Zoom meetings is? It's like Zoom meetings. Like you can do like uh, telephone. You can text or whatever like digitally. You can do meetings. So really cool company. And this guy built it by just dialing people in the phone book down the line, just calling everyone. Right? He built this whole company. It's a really cool story. And he tells everybody there, he says – my one piece of advice for you would be, do what you want to do. Do not do what you do not want to do. And for whatever reason, the first thought that popped in my head was, man, I don't want to go back to Charlotte. I don't want to go back to my cubicle. I like this job. I'm making pretty decent money. Everyone's really cool to me. The teams are great. People here are really intelligent and ambitious. I don't want to go back to this job. So I get back to my cubicle and then the regional director sends out like a mass email on January 1st. And the email is like, you have, imagine you have $82,000 in your bank account or something like that. And she tells this whole story about, you've got $82,000 in your bank account and it resets every day. And you can spend it on whatever you want, but you can't keep any leftover. It like rolls over to the next day and it disappears or something like that. But basically she was talking about how many minutes were in a year, right? So she was like, okay, this is how many minutes or hours or something you've got in this year. What are you going to make with them? You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to push yourself? And this was supposed to be like a super motivating email to get us rah, rah. We're going to sell the shit out of some stuff, right? <laughs> and it had like the complete opposite effect on me. I keep getting notifications. So the, uh, the effect it had on me is like, hmm, I've got 82,000 minutes or whatever in this year. How many of these minutes am I going to sit at this fucking desk? Uh, and then, like, then, then the next day, uh, it was lunchtime. I, like, had my laptop or whatever, my comp company computer, and I did, like, a factory reset. And then I basically had my backpack, and I kind of, like, just did, like, one of those sweeping things where I put everything in the backpack. And then I got up, and I didn't say anything to anybody, and I went to lunch. And I texted my, uh, my manager, my, like, local manager. It was, like, a team of five of us. And I texted him. I was like, hey, man. Really appreciate everything you did for me. I'm not coming back to work. And that was the end of it, man. Career over. Like I was like, and and he was a, uh, he was like, okay, well, let's talk about this. And then he tried to get me to come back because I mean, honestly, they had invested a lot of time and money into me. So that's why I kind of feel bad about it now in retrospect. And uh, a couple guys actually called me up. Like, come on, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? Come back. And I was like, don't. I can't. I can't talk to you guys because you'll convince me to come back and I can just tell this isn't what I, what I want to do. Okay, so during all this time, I had been writing that book about dating, right? I'm like, okay, I got to finish this book. This is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to blog and write about these books and eventually I'll have that passive income that I dreamed of and everything will be cool. So let's see if I missed anything. Mm -mm. All right, I got to finish this book. So I finished the book. I pay someone $1,800 to edit it, right? I take like the little bit of money I got and I like empty my 401k and pay like the rest of my rent for the year so that my roommate isn't screwed because I'm not going to go back to a job was like my final decision. Finish the book, publish it. The book's called Hang Ups and Hangovers. It's on Amazon if you want to get that. But uh, I publish it and I get a couple sales. I'm very motivated and I'm like, awesome, cool, great. And uh, so I'm like, okay, well, what I got to do now is got to make more books. I gotta like write a sequel. So I go underground, I like shut everything off, which is like how I usually operate when I wanna do something. And then I work, I work, I work, I work, I work. And I create a sequel book, which I think is better. It's called Redheads and Bedspreads. 
if you want to check that out on Amazon. Anyway, um, so I create a sequel in three months and I publish it. And this one gets absolutely no sales. Zero. I was like, well, what the hell happened, right? I just wrote a book. People liked it. I got some good reviews. I wrote a second book and nobody even knows it exists. So I go on like Google and I start looking around like, what the hell? Why isn't my book selling? <laughs> And it turns out I didn't know what the hell marketing was. Like I had a, I had a decent idea about sales. I had a pretty good concept of that kind of stuff, but I didn't understand marketing and I didn't really understand like building an audience. So I learned through these like author marketing blogs that you have to have people who want to buy your book. And I never cultivated that audience. And, and looking back, author marketing is like, I could dominate that niche now, I think, just knowing what I know now. They're not... They're not very uh, savvy. So, okay, so I got to build a website. I got to build a website, and then they're telling you, like, you know, write about your characters, write about your people in your book, write about this, write about that. And then I'm diving deeper and deeper. I'm like, okay, I can write about all this stuff, but still nobody gives a shit. Like, all right, I need to figure out how many people give a shit. All right, now this is where we're getting to copywriting, finally, right? So I understand that I need an audience. And I understand that I can't just tell them, like, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. I understand that I have to give them something that they want. So I'm like, okay, how do you do that? Like, how the hell do I figure out what they want and then give it to them so that they'll buy my book? And, uh, hmm, let's see. I can't get this thing to focus now. Focus on your boy. There you go. All right, sorry about that. So yeah, so how do I get these people to buy my book? Because I don't have a job and I refuse to go back to one. That was like my whole thing. So, I learn about building a website. I learn about like affiliate and niche and Amazon.com stuff like that, and like uh, <clears throat> doing that. I learn about SEO and then also an SEO because I'm trying to get people to come to my website, which is realkylemilligan.com. If you search how to get a girl on Tinder, I am the number one search result on Google because I learned SEO. It was pretty cool. And that's basically what the, uh, the books, the novels are about. So uh, I built all that, trying to get people to buy my damn books. And in during that, I start to hear about this thing called copywriting. Like you can't just SEO people. You have to woo them with words now. Once they get to your website, you have to like convince them to buy your shit. And I was like, what do I got to do to sell these books? So um, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to learn copywriting now. So I do what I always do when I want to learn something. That is... I immediately just like go to the authorities. Like uh, I, I, I don't want to mess around too much in Facebook groups. Like I'm gonna, I'm just gonna jump in. And this is how I landed on Agora, kind of dumbly. So I'm listening to, uh, I'm driving to my sister's house in Illinois from North Carolina. It's a long drive. I'm listening to Choose Yourself by James Altucher on Audible, and I get bored. It's like my third read through, and it's like I'm gonna change it up. And I go to Copy Chief Podcast, and on there is this guy named Joseph Schrafer. And Joseph Schrafer is the publisher at Agora Financial, and he just created this thing called a Copy Camp, which is like a giant uh, training program, right? He's gonna train to he's gonna train new people who want to learn copy. And I was like, hey, it's me. I don't know shit about copy, and I know I need to know it, so I can sell my books, and I'm gonna come get that thing. So in the podcast, he lists his personal email. And he says, email me. Here's what we're looking for. We're looking for dudes who read more than anybody else. And I was like, okay, I do that. He said, we like people who work hard or something. And people who, he had three things. I remember read more than anyone else's one. Maybe like work hard or are naturally curious, I think was one as well. And I was like, okay, cool. I got this. So from my time working in sales. The easiest way, here's a hack for you. The easiest way to sell anything is to just ask the customer a question. They'll tell you, oh, well, I, I hated this about the last guy, and I really wish they'd have done this, and this is what I'd love to see in a product. Okay, well, guess what? We do that, that, and that. I just had to repeat what they said right back to them. That's how I sell stuff, and it works pretty damn well. I was able to dominate in, my, uh, in the Verizon Fios thing I was working in. So... Uh, so I go to my email, I go to Gmail, and I'm going to email this Joe Schrafer guy because I'm going to go to this, I'm going to steal this copy camp uh, training. That was my plan. I was going to steal the copy camp training 
and then go sell my books, Hang Ups and Hangovers and Redheads and Bedspreads on Amazon. So um, I email him and I say, hey, Joe, just heard your podcast. That sounds terrific. I'm actually that guy. Guess what? I read more than anybody else. In fact, uh, I read all kinds of weird shit. My girlfriend gave me a SEO manual for Christmas. Can you believe that? Anyone else would have threw a lamp at the wall. I think I literally wrote that. Not me. I was stoked. So I was like, yeah, I read a lot. I'm naturally curious. My bookshelf is lined with a bunch of weird shit from the dating stuff, right? Because I was, I, was, I was all about that. And then uh, SEO, building websites. I was into all everything, man. So I was like, cool. I got that covered. I'm curious, dude. I work hard. I only have a job. I work like 20 hours a day. I wasn't making any money, though. Okay, so that's important. So Joe doesn't answer me. <laughs> so Joe never answers my email. And I was like, oh, this is frustrating. And I also know from sales, like, fuck it. Like, just basically, <laughs> what, what are they saying? Like, Wolf of Wall Street? Like, until they buy or die or something like that? Just basically, like, okay, if, if I'm just going to uh, hit him back until he answers my email. So what I did very cleverly is I just hit reply, and I wrote the word B-U-M-P, bump, right? And then a smiley face, and it was all caps. Like, look at me, damn it. And I sent it to him. Keep in mind, I have no idea what Agora Financial is. I have no clue who Joe Schrafer is, but he was on the Copy Chief podcast, and he had a training that he was gonna pay people to take. And I was like, cool, me, I'm doing that. So. I'm like, I'm just going to hammer this dude till he answers me or tells me to fuck off or gives me a job. So eventually he replies me on accident in a what seems to be the wrong list. He's like, here's that thing you requested. And I was like, nope, that's not me. By the way, see this thread below. This is an email I sent you last week. Answer me. So uh, he answers that and he goes, oh, hey, cool. Nice to meet you. Would you be interested in moving to Baltimore or Florida? I was like, Florida? Baltimore sucks, everybody. It's terrible. So, um, give me a thumbs up if you think Baltimore sucks. I don't know. I need to, I need to think of a way to like engage with the, with the audience. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> so that happened. And then, all right, let's see what's, let's see where we're at in my notes here. So I get the job. I do. I get the job. Like they fly me out to Florida and, oh yeah, let me, let me give you a big lesson. Um, stay stupid. Like I was, I was so dumb that this actually worked like, uh, and do the work by Stephen Pressfield. He says the, the artist's greatest allies are stupidity and arrogance. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. I've met like my biggest heroes because of it. I've got this job because of it. And uh, what happened was I got flown to Florida. I met the best, the, the highest grossing copywriter in Agora Financial, right? And he offered me a job like six times, right? And I, for whatever reason, I was too stupid to be like, yeah, sure, great. Every time he'd offer the job, I'd respond with something like, I really like how you guys do this or this or this. I don't know why, but there, it came to a point where he was like, dude, do you want the job or not? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it. <laughs> so I get the job. The guy who hires me is the best copywriter in Agora Financial history, right? And I have no idea who any of these people are, what I'm getting into. I just want to steal the copywriting training and go sell my fucking books. That's really like, that's a whole plan. That's all I want to do because I don't want no job. I give up jobs. I walked out at lunch, never went back. Uh, so, ends up, let's see if there's anything else. Now I gotta wing it from here, I'm out of notes. All right, so what happens is, I say, okay, I get in the door and I have to move to Florida. So I'm like, okay, I will actually give this thing one year. I made that promise to myself. If I have to move, I might as well give it a year. And, uh, and then I was like, let's just see what happens, All right? The idea was, I'm gonna steal the, writing, the copywriting course and I'm gonna quit. Okay, so I think that's really the whole thing. That's the whole story, right? That was anticlimactic, right? I got the job because I was an idiot. Um, and then I think what, what's really important about that is people think that the copy camp, like copy camp is great. It's phenomenal, right? But I actually wrote my first front end before the copy camp. They wanted to get an entire class of people. They needed like 11 or 12 people, you know, and they only had like three or four at the time. So they wanted a whole class of people. So I got hired in October, and the copy camp wasn't until January. And they needed to get more people in the door. So for like a couple months, I kind of was just like working with like no training. So I kind of had to teach myself how to train. So uh, I, uh, 
got in the door, and I was like, hey guys, what do I read? I've, I've read, I've read Dan Kennedy's Ultimate Sales Letter, I read the Boron Letters, and I had Joseph Sugarman's Adweek Copywriting Handbook. And they were like, don't read any of that stuff. I don't read that shit. And I was like, well, what do you read? And they're like, don't read about copy, read copy. And I was like, hmm, that's an interesting way to look at it. So uh, I start to read copy, but I don't really know what the hell I'm looking at because I have no training in copy. Oh, I, I, I'm gonna circle back. One other cool thing <laughs> that I got the job that I didn't deserve. Um, when Joe asked if I wanted to live in Florida or Baltimore, he said, cool, talk to this guy. Talk to this guy. He says, send me a head and lead. I had to Google what a head and lead was. I didn't know what the hell it was. And uh, so I Googled it and then I just like wrote one and I sent it. And basically I copied like the exact same format of what was called like congressional checks at the time. I was like, okay, I just found congressional checks and I kind of copied what they did, right? And I just did it for, I was selling the, the book called Bigger, Leaner, Stronger by Michael Matthews. And instead of saying, Jeff in Arizona made $10,000, Susie in Kansas made $2,000, I said, I said like, Jeff in Connecticut lost 20 pounds, and Susan in somewhere made 50 pounds. And these were all uh, real testimonials I took off the website. So it was like, this is legit. But all I did was copy uh, a promo that I had seen elsewhere. Okay. So the point was, I had to start teaching myself copywriting before copy camp. And that's really important. Because that's actually the method that I've pretty much stuck with, and it's worked for me. It got me the job, okay? I wrote my first front end in, uh, I started in October, right? It finally got published. Like, it went into legal, I think, in January. It took me a really long time. And then in February, it was published. February of 2018, it's still running today. There's two versions of it running right now. They're making money right now. Someone just paid me some money, right? While I'm doing this. The important thing is like, I didn't do it by reading those copywriting books. I did it by reading copy, all right? And luckily I had a mentor who could show me like, these are the things you need to look for when you're reading copy. And so that's actually how I was able to do it. Copy camp with Agora Financial has definitely elevated my game, but I was able to actually produce a winning front end promo without copy camp first. And that's important because now I am actually writing a book on that very topic. I don't know what the name of the book is, but basically what I want to teach people is you need to learn how to read copy. That's way more important than reading books about copy. If I can teach you the language of copywriting, if I can inform you and show you how to dissect copy, which is all I had to go on. They said, just read old promos. Don't read the books. Read the old promos. And I was like, okay, cool. So I'll like dig up old promos somehow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that into a system for you to follow, like how to find those old promos, break them down so that you can write your own successful copy and make a bajillion bucks. Any questions from the guys? I feel like I've been talking at you and the whole thing of the live. I should have been talking with you a little bit. Let's see. I, I missed some notes. Yeah. The sales process did not translate to copywriting. Yeah. With copywriting, it was a little bit difficult because uh, I thought, you know, I knew a little bit about sales, but that did not help me with copywriting because uh, my sales process was just to listen to the customer and then repeat back to them what they told me, and it was very effective. With copywriting, I had like nothing to start with. I have one shot to make a sale, and I can't really hear you say anything, so I had to like anticipate and say all that shit to you ahead of time. But yeah, the moral of the story is, it wasn't like the copywriting books that really got me going. As a matter of fact, I knew nothing about copy when I got hired. I got the job because basically I took imperfect action. I think that's a really big lesson from this. Like, I didn't even know who Joe was or Agora Financial. I was that green. I had no clue about copywriting, man. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just wanted to go get free training from a company that had been on this podcast and the podcast said they were the best, right? Copy Chief says, oh, these guys are the biggest, baddest, best copywriting thing. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go to the authority and I'm just gonna learn from them. That's like what I think is the smartest way to learn anything. That's why I kind of uh, crapped on Facebook groups yesterday. <laughs> um, all right, any questions, I'd be happy to field them.
Hit like if that story inspired you at all, or heart, or even smiley face when you see how stupid I am and how I somehow managed to get a job at Agora. But yeah, I, I wrote my first promo before Copy Camp. I wrote my second promo during Copy Camp. They're both still running. They're both still making money. And I did it with this method that I'm putting in this book. You need to learn how to read the language of copywriting, all right? You don't need to read about copywriting. You need to learn the language of copy. Which Agora division? Agora Financial. Good question. We did, uh, we're, we're, we, we came this close to breaking 300 million in revenue this year. Actually, on, on December 30th, you know, we were like this close. And I don't know the final number, but I didn't see like a big email celebrating 300 million, so I think we probably just missed it. But yeah, it's uh, definitely the biggest division by like a landslide, like I said. Maybe like double. I think next in line would be Money Map. And my promos are still running as controls. So that's like, that just kind of proves like uh, the system works, right? <laughs> I'm working with some of the best copywriters in the world and my promos are still running. No one's knocked them off. So, uh, and, and it's really crazy because I didn't spend years and years studying. I didn't, I didn't have like, I just had this one method, man. And it was like, I'm going to dissect all the best copy. And and I had a good mentor who could really help me out with uh, Jason Capital. I don't know what Jason Capital is. But uh, who's Jason Cap? Is that a, who's Jason Capital? <laughs> Someone's gonna be like, oh, you dipshit. You don't know Jason Capital? Dude, I'm telling you. All I know is this one method I apply it religiously, and it's what got me where I am right now. So, I'm, I think it almost illustrates the point that I am super green, and I only use one method. I found like the one thing that worked, and I've just been repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. I keep looking at my notes, but I ran out of notes a long time ago. I'm definitely happy to, uh, lol, not that guy. <laughs> Who's chasing capital? Now I'm kind of curious. I'm gonna Google this dude in a second. All right, dudes. So, recap for anyone who just tuned in. It all started with a dude who was trying to get girls because he wasn't popular in high school. He started learning psychology. <clears throat> When's the book going to be ready? <laughs> um, you know, I'm at 6,000 words, about 20, what is it, 15 or 20 pages right now? I think if it's an 80 page or 100 page book that It'll be pretty valuable. Watch me say that and then put out a 60 page book. Um, I would ideally, I know, I just read about the planning fallacy today and in, in, uh, thinking fast and slow, and I know I got the planning fallacy going on. I'd love to be done within two weeks. And that's if I put some serious elbow grease into it. And that, I want it to be like uh, pretty polished. I, I thought about having like someone edit it and look it over, but I'm, I might self edit. <clears throat> so yeah. College Kyle was still insecure as high school Kyle, so he learned psychology. He had to get a job, so he went and, I don't know why I'm doing my fingers. This isn't step by step. So he went and got a uh, master's in accounting, did the CPA exams, and got fired twice. So he went into sales where he could get paid for his efforts. And that's kind of like, kind of segueing a little bit into copywriting there. Uh, learned the sales process, worked as much as he could. Found out there was still a ceiling because he was trading dollars for hours. Trading hours for dollars. Right? I can only work six days a week. I, I could max out. Got a B2B job, left. Wrote two books. No one bought the second one. I realized I need to learn marketing. And I need to learn how to tell people what they want and give it to them. Then I contacted Agora Financial because I needed to learn copywriting for free and actually get paid to do it. Before I ever got that training that I came over here to steal, I wrote my first front end promo. It's still running today. And that's the story. It's really, and I think the moral, if I have to give you a moral, is, is action, man. Action, 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 action. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I don't know what the hell I'm doing right now. I'm just rambling at the camera. You guys are commenting and watching. <laughs> I, I'm, I just stay stupid, like Stephen Pressfield says, and uh, do the work. All right. I don't have any other. I don't have any other cool stuff to tell you about. Uh, if you don't have anything else to ask me, I think I am going to sign off. Remember. 
the the system I used to write my first front end before I got into copy cam is actually the same system that I'm going to write this entire book about. It really is about dissecting and learning the language of copy. And they say accounting is the language of business, right? I know because I got a master's in accounting. Basically, accountants speak their own language. When, when an accountant says P, P, and E, all right, when they say accounts receivable, when they say cash, when they say accounts payable, when they say any of the stuff, expenses, it comes with this whole like list of definitions and understanding. Like when you say P, P, and E, I know it's this and not that, all right? When you say leases or you say this or like assets, liabilities, you say any of that stuff, it automatically comes attached to a meaning for an accountant. For a copywriter, and this is something I've seen with the YouTube videos I've been doing is like, I'll say urgency, I'll say scarcity, I'll say this, I'll say that. And for me, it means something. Like I understand exactly what I'm talking about. I understand how to implement it. That language is totally like ingrained, all right? Because all I've done is I've learned how to dissect very successful copywriting and then translate it into plain English for me so that I can just speak it. It just flows from me. It's not even like something I have to try to think about anymore. And the disconnect between copywriting books of yesterday and this book that I'm writing is they talk to you like you already know the, the language, right? And they don't instruct you necessarily on how to speak the language of copywriting. And that's why I'm super excited to get it to you. That's my pitch. That's my live. This went way longer than I thought it would go. And I don't see any way to tell how long it's been going. But no more questions have come through. Smash like if you... Love your boy Kyle Milligan and you uh, got something out of this. That's it. I'm out of here. Peace.